We good back there? Okay. Well, this will be, for the time being, the uh, final uh, Strength for the Journey class. Yes? Can we raise the screen a little higher? Let's see. I think we might be able to. Just a minute. Any better? Better? Okay. So as I just mentioned, this is going to, uh, for the, just for the time being, be the last strength for the journey class throughout Lent. And for all of you who uh, committed yourself to coming to all six of them, I am extremely humbled and honored that you did that. Thank you very much. I hope this has been something that's been fruitful for you just because... I've had a lot of comments from folks saying that just uh, in our upbringing, we haven't in the past couple of generations been as catechized as we would have liked. A lot of times we're told this is how we do it as Catholic Christians and this is what we do as, ca as Catholic Christians, but we're often not told the why, the why we do what we do and the why we need to do what it is that we do. Because when we neglect the why and we're stuck with just the how and the what, there's truly a strong essence of what it is that we do, but even more so who we are, because yes, we do certain things as Catholic Christians, we're about certain things as Catholics, but most importantly, it's who we are. See, being Catholic is not something that we are meant to do. We're not part of some 2,000-year-old really cool club or anything along those lines. The Catholic that we, uh, profane, we profess to be is meant to be who we are. It's meant to be an identity. We bear the name of Christ as Christians. So what does Christian mean? It means Christ follower. And so in a name is one's identity. And so we are meant to reveal the identity of Christ through our own. You call us Father. Why do you call us Father? Because it's not merely a title that was earned over the, the grueling uh, seminary formation of several years, but it's an identity. Father is part of my name. It's a name. And so, therefore, we are meant to be a father to all of you, a father figure. So, we're just going to talk a little bit today about, as you can see, the missionary mandate of the church. And what that means is, is that before the ascension, before Christ ascended back to heaven to the right hand of his Father, he gave the apostles the great commission. Go out into all the world and tell the good news. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So he didn't say just to the numbers who were following him throughout his earthly life, okay, this is only for you, so do with it what you will, and good luck. He didn't do that. So he gave us a charge to uh, go out and profess what it is that has been revealed to us. That's exactly what the apostles did. He goes, they go out after the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, once they are fully sanctified, they go out and announce all that they had heard and seen. And so that is something true to this day, and it has been throughout the course of our history. We hear from the priest, the, the, the vicar of Christ, the one who is acting in persona Christi, at the end of every Mass, go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your lives. We are re-echoing the great commission of Christ to go out and proclaim the good news. And it's something that we are called to do. It's not something that's suggested, just like baptism and the Eucharist are not suggested, they are required if we expect to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so we have some uh, wonderful things that are happening throughout the world in, in the church. There is an increase, mainly through Africa and through Asia, of an increase in the faithful growing in number. And so our Catholic number now is close to 1.4 billion and throughout the world. Now, if all of those folks are practicing the faith or, or going to Mass every Sunday, unlikely. But the point is, is that the Holy Spirit is still greatly at work. And how do our numbers grow like that? It's because, of course, people are keeping their minds and hearts open to what it is that the Holy Spirit is wanting to do for them and to bestow upon them, but mainly it's through the work and the efforts of missionary disciples. And that's why we're here. You know, Father Fred and my vision for the parish 
is to create missionary disciples amongst all of you. You know, we receive a lot of hostility in the Americas right now about Christianity, but we can't afford to be intimidated. We can't afford to be afraid of it because we have this obligation. You know, the book of Tobit says that life for mankind is warfare. We are in a fight and we'll be in a fight until the day we draw our last breath. That's why we're called the church militant. We are in a fight fighting against the forces of darkness, the forces of evil. Because if none of that existed, then what would the main role of the church be, right? Jesus came to save us. Well, what or whom did he come to save us from, right? He came to save us from the influence and the deception of the devil. And so we have that commission to go out into all the world and to tell the good news. Do we need to turn the lights off? Is this okay to see? Do, this is, a, turn the lights off? Okay, let's, let's just maybe turn one off here. How's that? Okay. okay. No, hold, hold, hold your applause until the end. Okay, so let's take just a, 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 a quick recap here. See, we've talked quite a bit. See, this would, this would originally be the entire course, course plan that I would teach. See, from beginning to end, see, we have kind of scattered, pulled a couple of different subjects from the course plan to uh, teach to all of you something that are very significant. See, we see at the top here just a brief walk through salvation history and the life of Christ at the bottom. So we would talk about, okay, what has been revealed to us in salvation history and how we are meant to apply that to our daily lives, reflect, reflecting the identity of Christ. And so we focus today on how the world was created for the sake of the church, as the, as the Catechism acknowledges. And St. Clement of Alexandria says very beautifully that just as God's will is creation, is called the world, so his intention is the salvation of men, and it is called the church. So right from the very beginning, we see in the Garden of Eden, for example, how we have what is called, as we'll see in a minute, the first sanctuary. So the first holy place, the first place of worship, the first place of relationship with God. Because if we know the Genesis story, we see how God walked with Adam and Eve, right? So he walked with them in the garden. So they were in relationship with him. They were in a perfect harmony with him. There was no sin, there was no death, there was no suffering, there was none of that. They were in a glorified state, union with God, who walked with them. And we talked a little bit, or quite a bit to a degree, the covenants, for any of you who were not here for the covenantal talks, covenant that God establishes through Adam, through Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, more and more of the chosen people are growing in number, and so we move from merely a household like Noah to a tribe, to a nation, to a kingdom, and then eventually the culmination of all of that in the Catholic Church. So all of that is a preparation for the Church, because in the beginning, Adam and Eve are in that glorified natural state. Right? God created Adam and Eve in His image and likeness and called them to share in His life. Again, our love of God adds nothing to His greatness, but He longs for it nonetheless. And a way that we show that love is through our faithfulness to our missionary commission. Now, is everybody given the task to go out and be teachers, to be prophets, to be a priest? No, we're not all given those particular tasks. But the point is, is that each one of us, whatever our vocation may be, has a task, a missionary mandate to go out and announce the good news through what we say, through what we do. I love that saying, you know, preach the gospel, but use words only when necessary. Meaning how, again, in our identity, our name of Christian, we are meant to reflect the image of Christ. And what better way to reflect the image of Christ than through the Eucharist, as we as a community are about to consecrate ourselves to the Lord's divine presence in the Eucharist. So we think about that. How can we return to the glorified natural state that we had lost without the presence of the divine within us? The presence of the divine was within Adam and Eve in a very unique way in a very glorified way. They would never have died had they not fallen. They would not have died, right? And so that glorified state that we have lost 
can be restored to us and it is offered to us by the sacrifice of Christ and it can only be nourished, strengthened, renewed by His divine presence within us. That is why the Eucharist is so, so essential, right? If we're only receiving the Eucharist in our life or throughout the year, do we have a good chance of salvation? No. No, we don't. Because it is something that is to be received regularly to remind us who it is that we are receiving and therefore who it is that we are called to imitate and reflect. Though we are sinners and we fall at times, we renew ourselves through the grace and the power of confession. Something else that is also meant to be received on a regular basis. How often? Once a month. Once a month. Absolutely. Very good. And so, that is how we are called through the mandate of Christ to return to that natural glorified state that we had lost. We receive the seed of Christ to the body that is the temple of his dwelling because he enters into us. We are called to allow ourselves to receive what he wants to give so that he can bring us back to that glorified state that we had lost. Because Adam and Eve, they enjoyed inner harmony between themselves and with all of creation. This is what's called original justice. And that, what that means is, is that you, know, there's, you see them sitting there with the lion, the predator, right? So there's total harmony amongst all of creation. There was no chaos. There was no aggression. There was nothing that was seeking to devour the other. There was no savagery or anything like that. They enjoyed total inner harmony within themselves. How oftentimes do we experience and a spiritual storm or a dark night of the soul like St. John of the Cross talks about. How often do we experience those storms brewing within us? A conflict of interest, a difficult decision that we have to make. None of that existed in the garden before the fall. There was total inner harmony. And so that's something again that Jesus Christ comes to restore to us, to bring us. Of course, in this life, we still experience those inner turmoils, but when we come to a deep state of intimacy with Him, and we see this in the lives of the saints, that when we come to a very close and personal relationship with Him, that even amongst the inner turmoil, we can still find peace. And I love the story of the modern-day saint, Saint of Calcutta, Mother Teresa. If you read her works, her spiritual directors would tell you that for decades, Mother Teresa was experiencing a very, very dark night of the soul. She felt that God had distanced himself from her, completely cut her off. And so she was experiencing a very, very dark brewing storm interiorly within her. But if you had any encounter with her, you would see that how could that possibly be the case with the smile, the love, and all of the joy that she radiated, right? You wouldn't know that she was going through all of that interiorly. Only her spiritual directors did. But encountering her, you wouldn't know that. And so we see that through her relationship with Christ in the Eucharist, as she said, despite the fact that I'm experiencing this storm, I can radiate or do what it is that I'm doing because I'm spending hours before my Lord in the Eucharist, right? Allowing myself to receive that which he longs to give. So even amongst the storms, the dark night, we can still find peace. We can still find harmony. We can still find joy. As contradictory as that sounds, it's a very, very real thing. And so Adam and Eve knew the truth and their purpose for their life, to love God and each other. Because that's something that every individual needs. Not only are we made for the truth, the one truth, but also we are meant to have purpose in life. I mean, if you've ever met someone who's going through just a very dark night interiorly themselves because they're lacking purpose, right? You know, as human beings, we need purpose. We need action. We need goals in this life because that's how... We build on that sanctity, that inner harmony that God is going to give to us, but it also sets us on a direction that we are meant to go, right? And so that's why the, the fact that they were made for the truth, aware of the truth, and they understood their purpose is what, through the work and the grace of God, that inner sanctity, that inner harmony, the original justice that they experienced. They knew the laws that had to be obeyed and the way that they had to live, right? So God set standards for them, right? He set boundaries, right? Because if he just left one to our own devices, a lot of people tend to think that God, I've mentioned this before, that he's just some divine clockmaker, that he threw the entire cosmos into harmony and into existence and then just pulled back, left it to its own devices and doesn't intercede anymore. 
And we know that to not be the case because we see how from the very beginning he's setting the boundaries and the standards about how they are meant to remain in harmony with each other and with him. And so if there was no choice, if there was no free will, then it would be like Adam and Eve were little marionettes that were working according to manipulation of God's hands on his strings. And that's not love. That is not freedom. And that is not how our Lord is in communion with us, in relation to us, because he wanted them to choose him over themselves and to be in total balance and harmony with him and with each other. And so they shared in God's life in a state of supernatural friendship with him, which is called, mentioned before, original holiness. So we see original justice and original holiness at work in what is called, as I said, the first sanctuary. All of creation was a temple, a meeting place of God and man. The Garden of Eden was a sanctuary where God dwelt with his children. And we see in the church the sanctuary as well. I've asked this question before. Let's see who remembers. Where does the sanctuary in the church begin? The steps. That's right. So that's why we make an act of reverence, bowing to Jesus or genuflecting to him in the tabernacle as we enter into the Holy of Holies, the new Holy of Holies in the new temple. That is our Catholic churches. So we are entering into the sanctuary. And so we make an act of reverence towards our Lord. And in the beginning, it was Eden that was the first sanctuary where people were in, where Adam and Eve were in, a, again, relationship with God and with one another. So it was the place of meeting between man and the divine, just as the sanctuary is in our churches. It is where the divine meets the mortal, right? The sacrifice of the Mass, where heaven and earth unite, where the Holy Spirit descends into the elements of bread and wine, and then they become the fullness of God, body, blood, soul, and divinity where again only Jesus is the one who is sacramentally present, the Trinity remain forever united. So in receiving the Eucharist, we are receiving the fullness of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And just being aware of that reality and just actually believing in it, how could we ever leave or abandon something like that? And so that's why we're called to that missionary mandate, especially about the Eucharist, to help people understand why it is we believe what we believe who the Eucharist is, how we are to prepare ourselves to receive him, the right way to receive him, and then carry out that divine presence in both word and sacrament, that both that we receive at Mass out into the world in our daily lives, whatever our vocation may be. Because that is what leads to ultimate happiness and fulfillment, similar to what Adam and Eve experienced. Their happiness in paradise flowed from their friendship with God. If we continue to remain united with him sacramentally, our relationship, our friendship with him will continue to develop, mature, stre strengthen, and grow. Because Adam was king, priest, and prophet. He is called king because he exercises dominion over all creation. Call and the priest because he's called to attain holiness and to sanctify creation. So he's meant to use his priestly role to sanctify the rest of creation in the sanctuary of Eden. And he's also called prophet because he's called to speak the word of God to all creation. We see an image like this in St. Francis of Assisi where his, his spirit was so on fire th after his conversion that he goes and proclaims the gospel to the animals as well as to, the, as well as to mankind. And this is similar to what Adam was called to do. He's called to proclaim the, the, his relationship with God through his priestly and prophetic role to all the rest that dwelt in the sanctuary with him. We've mentioned before that when the high priest on Yom Kippur would enter past the veil into the Holy of Holies, the symbolism of the vestments and all the garments that he wore, because there's blue, there's green, there's red that he's wearing, it symbolized all of creation. So the blue for the ocean, the green for the land, and so on. All of creation would enter into the Holy of Holies with him to offer worship and sacrifice to God. It was an imitation, a reflection of Eden, and a preparation for the coming of the church. So that's why we have flowers, we have plants, and all those beautiful things that you see in the church in the sanctuary. It's not just to make it, uh, it's not to bling it all out and make it, everything look really cool and hip. No, it's a, it's a symbolic image, a symbolic reflection about through the power of the Mass, all of creation is there in worship with us. Again, it's a reflection of Eden. It's a reminder of Eden. We're trying to get back to that place of original justice and holiness, that place of paradise in the kingdom of heaven. We are on our pilgrimage. We are fighting the good fight in this life back to the first sanctuary. 
because in the garden there was no mediation of grace. It wasn't necessary. So we need the grace now because we have fallen, right? We're still living as priests, prophets, and kings through the anointing of our baptism. So we all share in the original call of Adam, but now we need the mediation of divine grace in order to help us to do that. Something that was not needed in the beginning because they were in a state of original holiness and original justice. Is, there, is this uh, making sense for everybody so far? Any questions? Okay. Now, of course, we come sadly to the fall. By breaking God's law, Adam and Eve sinned, and their friendship with God was broken, and they became afraid of Him. They were in perfect harmony with our Lord, but after they disobeyed Him, after they fell, they became afraid of Him because they lost God's supernatural life, original holiness. Again, they never would have died. They never would have died had they not sinned, but they lost God's supernatural life within them, right? Even though Adam lived to be literally 931 years old, he still died because he had lost the supernatural life that was originally given to him. And that supernatural life is given to us again, again through what? The Eucharist. The Eucharist. Everything comes back through the Eucharist. We are given that supernatural life again, though, yes, in this life we will still die. But what is prom promised to us? That all who believe in Christ and live according to His word, even if He dies, shall live. And we will be called back to original holiness. Because Adam and Eve, they had lost original justice. The harmony between man and creation was destroyed. And the human intellect, the will and emotions were also wounded. And we, also, we know that the human intellect, our will and emotions can lead us into all kinds of trouble these days without proper reflection, without proper discernment. And why? It's because we have lost original justice. Man loses sight of the truth by which he was to live. So his intellect, his will becomes darkened to a certain degree. He loses sight of what and how he was supposed to be living according to the way that God had revealed through the truth of original justice holiness. Man loses his way and direction and becomes inclined to sin. Suffering and death enter human history. And Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden and out of God's presence. The gates of heaven are closed. So how will mankind find its way back to paradise? Right? The cherubim are sent. A lot of people think that it was either Gabriel or Raphael who came to uh, seal the garden. But we know that those angels with flaming swords, after they had been cast out, they closed off paradise, and now they were set to wander the world. As I mentioned before, we are on that pilgrimage back to the first sanctuary, uh, to original holiness, to original justice, back to paradise that we had been cast out of. We have a question back there? You're going to have to talk a little louder, dear. Do we, do we know how long they lived in Eden before, before the fall? Well, if, uh, if we do, that's something I'm not aware of, I'm afraid. So I, can, I can't... Uh... Yep, that's a, that's, a, that's a very good question. I, mean, I actually don't know. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. That's, a, that's an interesting question. I'll have to look into that. But, but again, we see the preparation for the coming of the church through the covenant of Noah. A lot of churches, if you ever look at the ceiling, there's the, the chapel of my old seminary in Denver. It has a lot of, it's, it's pointed and it has wood at the top. And if we, we look at it, it looks like the bottom of a boat. It's kind of like the bottom of the ark that Noah had built. Because why? Well, who were the first apostles? Fishermen, right? They were fishermen. So our Lord says, you know, come after me and I will make you fishers of men. So... We see an image, a parallel of the church with the Ark of Noah, as well as an image of Eden, the first sanctuary. How? Because all of creation, the two of every species, is gathered into the sanctuary of the Ark of Noah. And so, therefore, as we are meant to gather all nations into the new and eternal covenant with Christ, we see how the Ark is a reflection or a parallel of the coming of the church in the future, but also of Eden in the past. Because after the unity of the human race was shattered by sin, God at once sought to save humanity part by part, so He did not abandon us. The Father pledged to Noah to keep him and his household safe through the flood, 
and, they promise, and he promised never to wipe out the human family that way again. Excuse me. Now, the covenant with Noah after the flood shows the principle of the divine economy towards the nations. Now, the divine economy, what does that mean? So, it, mean, it refers to, again, the gathering in of all the nations. So, throughout the majority of salvation history, only the people of Israel, the direct descendants of Noah, would be involved in covenant with God. But it would be foretold in the future that at the coming of the Savior, all of the nations, the divine economy, as would be gathered into the covenant with God. So the covenant wouldn't be just reserved for the Israelites, the Jewish people. It would be open and available to all nations who would be willing to accept it. And so the remote preparation for this gathering together of the people of God begins when God calls Abraham and promises that he will be the father of a great people, of many nations. And this is in, to gather to the scattered humanity. God calls Abram from his country and makes him Abraham, so the father of a multitude of nations. So we see, again, a name here. So Abraham means father of many nations. His name was Abram in the beginning, but through his covenantal union with God, God changes his name, just as he changes the name of Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, to what? What does Jacob become? Or who does Jacob become? Israel. So Jacob's name will be changed to Israel in the future. So we see how a changing of a name is taking place when the covenant between God and Abraham is established. The people descended from Abraham would be the trustees of the promise made to the patriarchs. So the patriarchs, if you've never heard that term before, when we, was, we, we speak of the patriarchs of the faith, we talk about the patriarchs are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those are the three main patriarchs of our faith. You know, we are all not directly descended from Abraham, but he calls, he is called our father in faith because the beautiful life of faith that he lived and reflected, that is something that we are called to imitate. So they, the patriarchs, with the promises made, with the promises made by God, and the chosen people were called to prepare for that day when God would gather his children into the unity of the church. So throughout salvation history, they are meant to be preparing themselves for, total, for the total unity of the world, the gathering in of the nations into the new and eternal covenant. Now, the Mosaic covenant reveals uh, the legal state of the church, if you will. And what that means is God formed Israel as his people by freeing them from slavery in Egypt. Now, they were... Now, this was something that wasn't done immediately. Anybody know how long Israel was in Egypt as slaves? 430 years. Now, 430 years. Okay. So, let's raise our hand, shall we? <laughs> Come on. Come on. What if, what, if the kids, what if the kids were here? Well, mom and dad just blurred things out, so I'm going to do the same in class. Come on. Again, setting an example. Setting an example, right? That's the missionary mandate. Come on now, folks. I know you can do it. <laughs> so God established with them the covenant of Mount Sinai. Now, if you look at uh, Mount Sinai today, it's really rather remarkable. The, uh, the peak of the mountain for um, a, certain, uh, a certain elevation is completely black. It's like it was scorched by fire, like a, by a divine presence, if you will. So we see how the truth of God's presence took place on that particular mountain when he established the Mosaic Covenant. And what did he give to them at the Mosaic Covenant? Yes? The Ten Commandments, also known as? The Law. Right. So the legal state of the church. So God gives the people his law that they are called to live by. They are called to live a certain way if they are expected to get back to paradise. Now, a lot of people tend to think, well, I don't want to become involved with organized religion. Okay, you don't, uh, you don't like organized religion? You, you prefer the disorganized stuff? <laughs> Gosh, tell me how that makes sense. But anyway, they'll say that they don't want to get involved in organized religion because there are too many rules, there are too many mandates, there are too many this, that, or the other thing, and I want to be free. Right? I want to. I want to be free. <laughs> what does that mean? Okay. 
do you, do you find freedom in being enslaved to your passions and to your senses and to your desires? That doesn't sound like freedom to me. It sounds just like that very thing, enslavement, right? Because in the truth, do we really find freedom? Because the truth is how we were created and what we were meant for. And if we truly understand that, again, the how, the what, and the why about the truth, it's then that we come to freedom as something that our Lord promises. A lot of people tend to think that, well, oh, Father, you, you have said it. How can you possibly be free? And I say, easy. <laughs> yeah. I avoid a lot of problems, man. <laughs> I'm, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that marriage is, is, a, is a problem or anything like that. I just, I, it's, I just find it very, uh, very purifying is what, what I've witnessed. That's why married people, I think, go to heaven faster than priests. Any, anyhow, so the kahal of Israel, so the kahal, the assembly of Israel, so Moses, as we know, as we've heard, is a prophet who speaks to Israel on God's behalf and gives them the Ten Commandments, so the moral precepts, so the truth, okay? Now, we see this image here. I think we've seen this particular image before. Does this look familiar to folks? Okay. So this is what? No, no, no I'm kidding. So what, uh, what is that right there? Someone said the temple. It's not the temple because they had not yet arrived in the promised land. Joe? Yes, the, 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 the pillar of fire is above the Ark of the Covenant inside the tabernacle. So this is what this is. This is the tabernacle. So the people of Israel for 40 years are wandering in the desert. And before they settle in Canaan, in the promised land, when the temple will eventually be built by Solomon, the first temple, they have the tabernacle where we have the outer courtyard with the brazen altar where the animal sacrifices would be offered. And then outside of the tent, there's the labyrinth where the priests would purify themselves before going into the holy place. And then beyond the veil inside the holy place would be the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant is. And that pillar of fire is sitting over the place where God is dwelling in the Ark, in the Ark of the Covenant, in the Holy of Holies. So Israel was being led through the desert by day by a pillar of fire and then by night, excuse me, by a pillar of smoke during the day and then by a pillar of fire at night. And then when they set up camp and when they stayed in a certain place in the desert for a period of time, that flame would, as a symbol of God's divine presence dwelling, within, dwelling with them, it would remain over the place where he was in the Ark of the Covenant. That's why we have the red sanctuary candle in our churches. That red sanctuary candle is lit as a parallel and reflection of that flame of fire of the past. That flame signifies that God's divine presence is dwelling with us. Where? In the tabernacle, in the Eucharist, in a way that the Israelites of old never experienced. Right? And now all of us, not just the high priest, all of us now have access to his presence. Now the Aaronic priests, no, not ironic, the Aaronic. So Aaron, again, the older brother of Moses, the first high priest, mediate between God and the people through the sacrificial liturgy, so the ceremonial precepts, so the life. And then Moses and the elders, 70 of them, rule the 12 tribes of Israel through judicial precepts. So there it is, the way, the truth, and the life from the very beginning, right? Now, God dwells in the tabernacle, as I said, in the midst of his people. And again, just take notice of where the tabernacle is. It's right at the center of their camp, showing that the ritual practices that they've been given is meant to be at the center of who they are, right? Not merely what they do, but who they are. See, it was only in a sense of doing that Israel eventually ended up in the Babylonian exile. They were doing everything according to the ritual practices properly, but who they were was completely far from God. They were not living it. They weren't living their ritual sacrifices. They weren't applying everything that God had commanded them to do to their lives, to their hearts. They were doing again everything according to the rubrics again, but they weren't living it. So that's what eventually led them to exile, that though according to the books, they were doing everything right on paper, but it wasn't anything that was lived in their hearts. And that's 
where people fall short. You know, we come to Mass again to receive the divine life of Christ in word and sacrament, but we're meant to carry that out into the world and live that. You know, it's, we can't have, you know, one hour at church, then one hour in the club. Right? We, can't, uh, be, we can't be singing God's praises and then cursing up a storm later on. It doesn't work. It's completely contradictory, right? So we can't just be coming to church every, every Sunday for an hour and then uh, just go out living uh, an immoral life and, uh, the, other, the other six days. It doesn't work like that. It's completely contradictory, and that's what led to our downfall in the first place when we were heeding our own wills rather than what the Father had put for us in total and absolute freedom and peace. But they, again, the people of Israel, they have no direct access to his presence. He is hidden in the Holy of Holies. So the priests would, would mediate between God and the people because, again, only the priests could go into the tabernacle. Everybody else had to stay outside, right? So they don't have direct access to his presence. And again, we do. That's something that should be grateful for, especially living in the time of the New Covenant, because if we were living in these times, we wouldn't have direct access to Him. Their communion with God is mediated through the law, the liturgy, and sacrifices. Any of that sound familiar? The liturgy of the Mass, the sacrifice of the Mass, the law of God that we receive through the readings? Mm -hmm. So priests, prophet, and rulers. So Moses was a prophet who proclaimed the moral precepts of God to his people. There was the priesthood, the Aaronic priests, who eventually became also referred to as the Levitical priesthood from the tribe of Levi. Remember, Jacob had 12 sons, you know, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, so on and so forth. So Levi, the third oldest son of Jacob, who became Israel, the descendants of his line would end up being the priestly people. The men would end up being the priestly people. That is why, they, again, they received no land when Israel entered the promised, the promised land of Canaan because they had been given the honor of being the uh, priestly, of uh, fulfilling the priestly role given to them by God. And so we have the judicial precepts that are, that are first given by Moses and are seen to be exercised by the 70 elders. They are in charge of different groups of people through the tribes of Israel so that Moses has a lot of weight lifted off his shoulders, they are called to rule with him to make sure that people are living again, not just merely doing things according to the rubrics, but that they are actually living what it is that they have been, they have been given. Now again, we come to the Davidic covenant, where God's covenant with David transforms the national family of Israel into an imperial family, a, a dynastic kingdom over other states and nations. And God, he covenanted with David to build a worldwide kingdom by establishing an everlasting throne with the son of David. Now, there's, there's classes that I could do talking about the different kings for 400 years that would come after David. Some of them were very good. Some of them were very evil. But the point is, is that through David, God is striving to establish a kingdom of all nations. Now, all of the nations, again, at the time of David, are not being gathered into covenant with God just yet. But it's meant to be an image, again, of preparation, of expectation, a missionary mandate that is being established. Because Jesus, through the flesh, through Joseph and Mary, descendants of David, is the one who will sit upon the throne of David forever. So that Davidic kingdom has happened through that successor, Jesus, the new David. So, all the, so the kingdom of David has indeed been reestablished forever, and Jesus will forever sit on that throne. Where all kingdoms, all nations are now invited into covenant with him. The son of David was destined to rule over all the nations united as a royal family. So, so the son of David, you see how, this is all, how, the, how that title is capitalized? So the capitalization signifies the divinity of the one who is to come as the descendant, the son of David. It's Jesus Christ who is the son of David through his descent in the flesh. And so in their communion, the worship of the Heavenly Father within his house in the temple of Jerusalem. Right? So the original temple, right, the second temple after it was rebuilt after the Babylonian exile, 
is no longer there anymore. The temple was destroyed. There's only the wall that's there. But the temple indeed has been reestablished. What does Jesus say? In three days, I will destroy this temple and then raise it up again. He wasn't referring to the temple of Jerusalem. He was referring to the temple of his body. So it is that temple, the temple of the body of Christ that we all share in as his members that we now gather into. And we see the universality of the kingdom of David now here among us because no matter where you go, whatever continent, whatever country you're on, even though there might be cultural differences, according to the dogma, according uh, to the magisterium, everything regarding the faith, our ritual practice, our beliefs is the same no matter where we are. So all nations, all kingdoms have been gathered in and we all sit in worship in the temple of Jerusalem, in worship of the Son of David, our Lord Jesus Christ. And the purpose of this rule is to share with all the nations the wisdom, the truth, and the righteousness that God had originally given only to Israel. So now all people, all Gentiles, everybody outside of the original covenants are now invited into the new and eternal covenant in the establishment of the kingdom of David universally, because that is what the word Catholic means, the Greek word Catholicos, it means universal. So that's where we get it from. And then again, we come to the prophets who proclaim the word of God. The prophets during the time of the prophets are the mediators, the new mediators between God and his people, right? So Moses would eventually die and then prophets would come after him right? Like Samuel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, so on and so forth, where God had chosen these individuals to be the one who, would be, who he would be in communication with, and they would pass on his word to the people. So the word of God would be passed on to the people through the prophets. The priests continued the ritual sacrifices in the temple liturgies, and the king, during the time of the kings, would rule over the people. So a light to all the nations, just as we are called to be a light to the world, we receive the uh, invitation of God to be that very thing. Because it was through the prophets that God formed his people in the hope of salvation, in the expectation of a new and everlasting covenant for all to be written on their hearts. Through the prophet Ezekiel, we hear how God will put his law upon our hearts and upon our minds. So by natural reason alone, we know that there is a God. We have the natural inclination to know what is good, what is evil, what's right, and what's wrong. Even though, as we heard in the beginning, all of that can be shadowed and corrupted because of our fall. It has been written on our hearts the ability to be able to know and understand through natural reason alone that there is indeed a creator, right? And so God, through the prophets, informs his people that eventually all nations will be gathered into him. The prophets proclaimed a radical redemption of the people of God, purification from all their infidelities, and a salvation which will include all the nations. So centuries and centuries before the coming of Jesus, these men are seeing this unfolding. They are seeing this take place. And that is how we know them to be true prophets, right? Because what they foresaw took place. What they saw that would come has happened, right? Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Jeremiah 31, 31. So the prophet Jeremiah has been told by God is seeing that in the future, centuries after his life, that this will happen, right? And that is why Jesus proclaims repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What the prophets foretold is unfolding through him, who is the way, the truth, and the life made flesh. And no one comes to the Father except through him. So Jesus is the eternal prophet and the eternal word. Eternal meaning that he has always existed. So we see in the time of the Old Covenant, which is called the time of the Father, where the Father is in communication specifically with the prophets, but Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, is also in communion with them, is also in communication with them, because He is eternal. He only takes flesh at a certain point in history, but spiritually, eternally, He has always existed. Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, has always existed. He is eternal. That's why He says in the Gospels, before Abraham was, I am. So showing that he was there at the establishment of all of the covenants. 
He is the eternal high priest, the one who gives life. If he's the one who gives life, he is therefore the creator of life. He is the ultimate king of Israel, that foreseen, that prophesied son of David, who will sit upon the throne of David forever. But that throne doesn't become a mighty and glorious thing. His throne becomes the cross. And he is crowned not with a crown of gold, but with a crown of thorns. And he is crucified between heaven and earth, showing that he, upon the cross, is the bridge between God and mankind once again. The new Adam, as Adam's bride was formed from his rib, his bride, the bride of Christ, which is what? The church, is born from his side as well, when his sacred heart is pierced and outflows blood and water, the blood for the Eucharist and water for baptism. So all these parallels here, everything is unfolding and coming together according to the plan. Yes? How come the Jews don't believe this? It's, that, that's, that's the ultimate question, isn't it? <laughs> why, why, her question was, why don't the Jews believe in this stuff? And, and that's the ultimate question. I wish I knew. I wish I, I, wish I knew why they don't. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I knew. But uh, see, only when all of them believe will Jesus come back. That's also something that's been foretold. Only when all of the Jews in Israel converts to Christ will Jesus come back. So, so, but there are millions and millions of them, so we've got, uh, so we've got, uh, we've got work to do. So follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. Jesus chooses 12 apostles to be with him. So 12 symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel. Now we don't, I asked my professor in, in, uh, in the seminary one time if all of the 12 apostles were direct descendants of the 12 sons of Jacob. And they didn't know the answer to that question. I don't know if we know. But even if they're descendants or not, we know that the 12 of them are a reflection of the 12 tribes of Israel of old, showing that there is a new covenant being established with and through Israel, but one that will eventually gather in all the nations. So they are the ones who are to be sent to preach as his emissaries. So we see how the missionary mandate will eventually start with them. So three years, they're in formation and education with our Lord. They will go out eventually upon his ascension to heaven as his emissaries, his first missionaries, because in them, Christ continues his own mission. So that's where we get the word missionary. They're ones who carry out a specific mission. And Jesus says to them that he who hears you, hears me, and whoever rejects you, rejects me. So when we proclaim the gospel to people and we invite them in the invitation to their sins, if they reject us, they're rejecting him. The message that we're bringing, not our own. He sends us, the disciples, to preach the gospel to the kingdom of Israel. He gives them his own authority to cure sickness and cast out demons. And we see that taking place. Now, sometimes people will think that spiritual possession was actually a physical illness. But if we look at the original language, the Greek and the Hebrew that the scriptures are written, there's different... There's different uh, wording, there's different, uh, what's the word, there's different, um, there, there's, di there's different uh, verbiage that's used, there's different, uh, pa, there's, there's different, gosh, what's the word? No, no not, trans not translations, there's, uh, uh, there's different, the, the language, the words that are being used, there's different uh, language. Hey, what are you laughing, what are you laughing at? <laughs> yeah, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> so, he, 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 so, he, so, he, so, so, no, not interpretation, no, not interpretation, but, uh, but there's, uh, but the ver but the verbiage that's being used, it shows when there is physical illness and when there is spiritual affliction, because there's a distinction there, showing that no, there is actual demonic possession that is taking place, and the apostles, like Jesus, are given the authority to cast them out. You know, there are priests who work with people who are, de who are demonically possessed. And I'll tell you that there's the, the demons hide under symptoms of illness, just like the woman who was, who was bent over and hunched or the folks who were mute. It wasn't merely some type of physical illness. Now, this doesn't happen all the time. But the demons in those particular examples were trying to hide behind the uh, symptoms of a physical illness in order for not to be detected. But when Jesus, who of course sees who it actually is, he casts them out, the woman stands upright, and the one who is mute speaks, right? So 
these priests will tell you who work with folks who are experiencing this type of problem that there is a very big difference between spiritual affliction and physical illness, of course. So why don't we take a 10 minute break before we enter into discussions a little bit more about the New Covenant and we'll come back right, uh, right at 11. Sound good? Thank you, everyone. All right, so the New Covenant, the one that we are all living. At the Last Supper, Jesus forms the New Covenant with the House of Israel in the persons of the Twelve Apostles, the first bishops, the first priests of the Church. So there are two significant events that happen at the Last Supper. It is the first Mass, so therefore it's the institution of the Eucharist and the ordination of the first priests. So those are the two significant events that take place at the Last Supper. So put that one in your memory banks. Now, the 12 apostles represent, again, the 12 tribes of Israel and are the foundation stone of the new Jerusalem. See, Jesus promises these 12 that they will all receive a crown of glory. They will all sit upon a throne in the heavenly Jerusalem. And so we see in the book of Revelation, for example, how this comes to pass. These men are now sitting, all of them except John, who through no fault of his own, they all laid down their lives for our Lord. All except John were martyred. And uh, the ways in which the apostles were, were killed was absolutely barbaric. So it shows how their faith, their strength, and their reassurance in the Lord, how it matured over the course of the years, the decades that they lived and proclaimed the gospel after the ascension of Christ. So when we do that, we see the strength, we see the courage that our human nature is capable of despite our fallen nature when we continue to strive and pursue the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is through the Paschal Mystery, and if you ever hear that term and you don't know what it means, the Paschal Mystery is His passion, His death, His resurrection, and His ascension. So that is what the Paschal Mystery is, those four things. All four that we relive every single time we celebrate the Mass. It is through that mystery that Jesus accomplishes our redemption. For it was from the side of Christ as he slept the sleep of death upon the cross that there came forth the wondrous sacrament of the whole church. So we see the Catechism, paragraph 766, acknowledging that it was from the side of Christ, upon the piercing of his sacred heart, that his bride, the church, was born sacramentally. So again, there are two births of the church, the sacramental birth when and then the communal birth, which takes place when? Anybody remember? <laughs> Pentecost, that's right. So the communal birth happens at Pentecost, and the sacramental birth happens at the piercing of his side. And Jesus offers his life as a sacrifice for the sins of humanity. Remember, the punishment that was due to mankind, but one so severe it could only be fulfilled by a God, right? So Jesus assumes our human nature to relate to us, to experience everything that we do except sin and pays the price for our salvation as the God-man. As God, he pays the price as a man because that punishment was due to mankind. The origin and the growth of the church are symbolized by the blood and water which flowed from the open side of Christ. Therefore, again, we are given the Great Commission. Peace to you, says the Lord. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Not just the priests, but also specifically the laity. I mentioned in the beginning that there is an increase in our growth up to close to 1.4 billion Catholics in the world. However, there is a decrease amongst ordinations to the priesthood by over 2,300. So in many, in many different places, but especially here in the United States. So there are more of you and less of us. So that's why we need your help. We need your help. See, our attention can mainly be focused here at the community of St. Bernard's and the local community of Scottsdale. But the responsibility for, where, for so much more also rests upon you, right? Because you also, even though not sacramentally, you share in the priesthood of Christ. Through what? Your baptism. You share in that role according to your vocations, your particular missions as priest, prophet, and king. So that is the threefold mission of the apostles, to make disciples, proclaim the truth, baptize them, right? The action of priestly life, 
teach them to observe my commandments, the kingly way, right? See, sometimes we'll hear from certain folks, well, we don't need to evangelize, right? We just let people remain in their own creeds and their own codes and let them live according to uh, that uh, particular mandate and to the best they can. But no, we are called to evangelize. We are called to bring people into the fullness of the truth. We are called to bring about conversions. It's important, yes, that we have civil, peaceful relationships with people of religions and backgrounds, but at the same time, we need to be working to bring about a conversion of heart, right? Excuse me. So again, the church of the new covenant, the church is born in Pentecost, as we heard back there, right? After that, the apostles were no longer afraid. They were not cowering in the upper room anymore. They go out and say, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And hundreds of them were converted that day, right? There is salvation in no one else, my brothers and sisters. There is no salvation in Muhammad. There is no salvation in Martin Luther, and King Henry VIII, or Buddha. There is no salvation salvation in any of those guys only in jesus christ because what are we warned about from him is that many will arise claiming to be me there will be false prophets arising saying i am he do not believe them do not fall into a gospel of falsehood believe on in the lord jesus christ sorry about my typo there and you will be saved and you and your household if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So again, it's not just a matter of proclaiming and living according to the rubrics. It has to also be ingrained within our hearts. Why do we sign ourselves before hearing the gospel proclaimed? Let the gospel be within our minds, upon our lips, and within our hearts. Something that we think, something that we speak, and something that we are, something that we do. We don't just do that because we got an itch. And we're and we're and we're and we're and we're doing we're doing it for a very significant symbolic reason, because we need to confess it, we need to live it, and we need to profess it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the the question was: Is if a Protestant brother and sister walks up to you and asks the question, as they often do, "Are you saved?" and I'll and I'll say, you know. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to be. I'm trying to live in accordance with God's, uh, with God's commandments, even though I fall regularly, so I'm trying to be. But uh, I've, received the Lord, I've received the Lord's gift of salvation, and hopefully I will be saved, but I can't know because I haven't died yet. <laughs> now, how, how, can I know, how can I know if I'm totally saved if I haven't died yet? Because salvation is something that can be lost. It can be lost if people are living falsehood, if people are living in sin. So I want to be saved. I want to live in the way that's going to bring me freedom so that I come to salvation. But am, am I saved just yet? I don't know, because I haven't died. Does that, does, that, does that answer your question? <laughs> okay. So again, see, Jesus doesn't say, I am a way, a truth, or a life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the only one. So again, if someone who's living uh, the Hindu or the Buddhist lifestyle do they automatically go to hell? No, we don't proclaim that, right? If they've lived a good and righteous life according to the understanding of the natural moral law, as God has put upon our minds and our hearts, as we have said, then through Jesus, in a very real but mysterious way, they can be saved. But still, it is only through Him that they are. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who d d does not believe in the Son shall not see life. It's, it's very, there it is, in black and white. But the wrath of God abides on him, for whoever is not with the Son of God is against him. So that is why we are called to bring others through our missionary mandate into unity and harmony with him. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son, and whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. How? Because the Son and the Father are one in the same from all eternity. The Son has loved the Father, and the Father has loved the Son. And because of that love from all eternity, that love is personified in a third divine person, which is the Holy Trinity. It's, that's why it's very important to have a personal relationship with all three 
with all three of the Trinity, right? If we have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us, then we are having a relationship with the personification of love himself. If we are called to love and we are for love, well, how are we going to be able to do that if we don't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit? Yes? God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. So that's why we can never, ever, ever leave the church, the Eucharist, because that is where we receive life, because we are receiving the Son of God, who is the giver of life. And if we are not receiving the Son of God regularly, we do not have life within us. And if we don't, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? If we are neglecting our attendance in Mass, if we're neglecting our duties as followers of Christ, how will we come to such salvation, right? That's why faith alone is not enough. See, we see when our Protestant brothers and sisters ask, uh, ask us that question, right, Joe, that, uh, you know, are you saved? Well, Again, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to live according to the way of Christ, despite my failures, my sins, and my shortcomings. I'm trying because I know that faith alone is not enough. Faith without works is dead, specifically as the Apostle James reminds us in his letter. One of my favorite books in the New Testament is the letter of James. So again, Jesus says the necessity of baptism. I've said that many times, that baptism and the Eucharist are not things that are suggested. Just, you know, you, know, you can do this if you want to. It's not, that, it's not that. You know, people ask us, well, why do, we baptize in, why do we baptize infants? Why not wait till they're older where they can choose it themselves? Well, it's because we want them to receive the grace and the, sancti and the sanctity of the fullness of the truth as early as possible, right? You know, people will decide whether or not they want to continue to live the faith later on in life, which is very, which is very sad if they, end up, uh, if they end up doing so, but, but uh, no, no one's keeping them prisoner here. No, we want them to. We want them to choose it. You know, Adam and Eve in the beginning to obey God, but God wants to be chosen. He wants to be with us, right? And we need to choose to be with Him, because sadly, even people can choose freely not to believe in Him. Yes, Mary. Father, what about those who are born and raised Catholic, and then they decide that they're you know they're no longer Catholic, but they're really strong Christians? Where do they fall? They fall, they fall in Protestantism. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the question was if there are people who are raised Catholic, but then eventually end up saying, no, I'm not Catholic anymore, but I'm still going to be a devout practicing uh, Protestant Christian. Well, they are still, they still have faith in uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, yes, but they are depriving themselves of sacramental grace, which is going to aid them in the way of imitating, the, of imitating Him and receiving newness of life that He bestows through that, that sacramental grace. Because as we said, you know, in the beginning, grace wasn't necessary before the fall. They had original justice, they had original holiness, and so now, because of our fall, we have need of the mediation of grace, and that is mainly bestowed upon us through uh, the works of the sacraments. So when people disconnect themselves from that, they are depriving themselves from the, the proper full resources they need to truly reflect the image of Christ. Those, they still believe in Him, they can imitate Him, yes, but they are depriving themselves of that which is extremely significant. Sure, they can go to heaven, but that doesn't diminish the fact that uh, we are called to bring them back, nonetheless, because we know that the Catholic Church is the original church, and therefore everything that we have and do is the surest way to enter the kingdom of heaven. So, can they be saved? Yes. Do they put themselves at greater risk of being lost? Also, yes. So, that, so that's the thing, right? You know, we don't, uh, which is why we don't condemn anybody. We don't hate, we don't condemn anybody. That's uh, only, only people end up condemning themselves. But at the same time, that is why we are called through our missionary mandate, the Great Commission, to go out and make disciples, teaching them the how, the what, and the why. The faith is the fullness of the truth. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Yes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to. Uh, we, we we have some bickerers up here. You've got to repeat that uh, that second one. So um, I went to a Christian college, 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly right. So, Well, what I say to them, so sometimes I'll do this. <laughs> hey, Siri, who, who founded the Catholic Church? Jesus created Catholic Church. <laughs> hey, Siri, who founded the Lutheran Church? Martin Luther created Lutheranism. So that's something that I'll do. Yeah, and we'll point them to the history lessons that we just re that we had in these courses, showing that yes, we are the original church. We are not a cult. We are the ones who were founded by Jesus Christ, the original church. See, the word Protestant means to protest. So in the 16th century, especially the Protestants, who are yes, are still Christians, they protested certain things that were going on in the church, and there were certain things that should have been protested, but they handled it in all the wrong ways. So instead of addressing the issues within the church, they decide to what? Create their own, right? So I would always ask them that question. Say, okay, well, if you think I'm a part of, your cult, of a cult, well, I'd like to ask you, who founded your church? So what church do you belong to? Evangelicalism, Protestant, uh, Pentecostalism, Lutheranism, Methodist, what are you, right? And then refer to them in the scriptures. Was it, intended, was it intended for the church to be one or was it intended for the church to be divided, right? So there's over like over 100,000 different Protestant denominations in the world now. So if they, if they say that they love the Bible, they should say, well, you should be thanking Catholics then because that's our book. <laughs> we put it together, right? Does that, does that help? Does that make sense? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yes, the, the yes, of, of course. You know, there sadly have been some uh, some uh, some evil popes in the past. Nobody's denying that. Some were adulterers, some were murderers, and so so nobody's denying that. But what people so often t tend to forget is that the church is an organization built up for sinners, right? You no. Know, we are built up for as we are all sinners here because we are sinners who have acknowledged that we need a savior. And that's why we're here, right? And so everything that has been founded by Christ is still practiced and preserved to this day. Note the dogma, the theology, everything regarding the uh, liturgy, the sacramental graces, everything has stayed the same. None of that has changed. It does not change. And when people call us judgmental, it's true that the word says that, yes, do not judge and you shall not be judged. However, when we say that we are, when we are judging, we are not judging people as people. We are judging actions, right? And we say to people, well, I'm not judging you unrighteously. I'm judging you according to the word of God, which you claim to believe in but are not following, right? So I'm not, that's not to say that I'm better than you. That's to say that I love you enough to be able to tell you the truth rather than to remain in error, right? Well, if you don't, if you, the world will say, well, if you love someone, well, then don't offend them. Huh? <laughs> come to correction? Are we going to come to growth? We don't point out where we are falling short of God's grace and falling short of God's glory, right? So we, ju we judge actions. We're not judging people because that is the mission and the purpose of the church, to call out evil and sin wherever it may reside, right? So that we can correct it, so that we can invite people into that Davidic kingdom, building up the kingdom of God here on earth. And we can't do that if we're divided. That's why we're meant to be united. From the very beginning, the church was meant to be one. Does that help?
Okay, you're, wel you're welcome. Good question. Well, let's say, let's save the since we're pressed for time. Let's save uh, some of the questions until later on. Okay, these are very very good questions, and I'm happy to answer. But we want to try to get through all the material here. So again, in the early church, we have the Hebrew scriptures that are eventually coming together. And uh, a couple of centuries down the line, the entire scriptures, the Roman canon, will be completed as the Bible. And then we have the sacred liturgy that's continuing on. And we see uh, the first century sources from St. Uh, Irenaeus, from St. Justin Martyr that we've covered, that talks about how even in uh, the early second uh, century, just as uh, even the, apo the apostles were dying and we had the, early, the disciples of the apostles, like Justin Martyr, I believe, was a disciple of one of the apostles. I think it might have been John, but I'm not 100% uh, sure, so don't quote me on that. But uh, we see how we have the Mass, the liturgy, everything that is taking place today was taking place back then. That's one of the foundational roots that we have to know that we are indeed the original church. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So we see even the, the Acts of the Apostles is acknowledging that the people are following the ways of the apostles, passing on everything that they had heard, seen, and received from Christ. Just because oral tradition, as well as written tradition, was extremely, extremely important to the Jewish people. And that's something that the apostles, as Jews originally, continued to maintain. And that's something that is maintained in the early centuries of the church. And so again, the church today, we have the, the sacred scriptures, the truth, the sacred tradition, the life, and the magisterium who show us the way. All shepherded by the Holy Spirit, the advocate promised us by Christ himself who first descended upon us when? Nancy? <laughs> oh, she, she's shy. <laughs> That's so cute. It's, uh, the, 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 <laughs> the first at, yes, yeah. Pentecost. That's right. <laughs> Okay, okay, that's, uh, that's all right, that's all right. Well, this is going to be something that we can help uh, uh, bring about conversion of hearts for them. But he, uh, he said it, he said it, the whole, at Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit first descends upon us as inspirator, animator, and again as the, uh, sorry, I can't pr pronounce that word properly, it's the, uh, the guarantor, right? So he showed the guarantor, meaning that through the infallibility of the magisterium, according to moral law, there is no room for error in that particular place. And now we have the seven sacraments, right? So the Father makes the plan for us to participate in Trinitarian life by sending us the Son, who makes the plan effective and gives us access to it by sending the Holy Spirit, who brings about the effects of the plan and makes it work through what? Through the church, through us. He dispenses the mysteries, the deposit of faith, and the deposit of grace. So Pentecost is not only the birth of the, the communal birth of the church and the sanctification of the apostles, but it's also an event depicting, showing the deposit of grace, right? That's what sacraments are. They are visible symbols that confect invisible grace that have been given to us by Jesus. And we see a reality of that in the Pentecost, and that grace is continu continuously shared in the seven sacraments. Baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, penance, the anointing of the sick, matrimony, and holy orders, the priesthood. Now, here we go. The sole church of Christ, which our Savior entrusted to Peter's pastoral care, because the church was founded upon Peter, the rock. So again, we see a name change. What was Peter's name before it was Peter? Simon. Simon. So Simon becomes Peter when he is the first one to, to identify Jesus as the Son of God. He says, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and gates of hell will never prevail against it. So through Peter's pastoral care, the commissioning him and the other apostles to extend and rule it, it being the church, subsists in the Catholic Church, governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him. So the Pope is the successor of Peter, who sits upon the chair of Peter, and the bishops, who are his representatives ruling with him, who are the successors of the apostles. For it's through Christ's Catholic Church alone, which is the universal help towards salvation, that the fullness of the means of salvation can be obtained. All men are called to belong to the new people of God. So we don't shun anybody, right? We only shun sin. We shun evil. We want to invite all people into 
the new Davidic covenant, building up the kingdom of God, gathering in all the nations. And again, that is our missionary mandate. Go out to all the world and proclaim it, right? See, a lot of people will say, well, keep your ideology and keep all, keep all that stuff to yourself. Don't force it on me. We're not forcing it on anybody. We're not, holding a gun, uh, we're not holding a gun to somebody's head saying convert or die. We're not forcing anybody. We're simply giving them the choice, right? We're giving them the choice by informing them, right? We're not trying to indoctrinate people. We're not trying to brainwash people. We're teaching people how to think, right? Because when we understand the proper way to think, that is what leads to freedom. That's what leads to understanding the truth, right? So like Adam and Eve were given the choice in the garden, everybody else is given the choice as well. So we're not forcing our beliefs or our ideology or anybody. We're simply trying to help people understand who we are and what it is that we truly believe. Because like our friends at, uh, at the... The uh, Christian, i.e. the Protestant school that you're at, people have a lot of false understandings about who we are and what we teach. People, for example, think that we worship Mary, which we don't. So we got to help them understand, you no, know, the certain things that you may have heard about us has probably been told to you in order to keep you away from us, right? So that you don't experience that freedom, so that you don't experience that joy, that peace, that gift of salvation that is available to you should you choose to accept it. So that's why the church is necessary for salvation. The church, again, is, depict, is depicted as the ark of God's grace. I was saying earlier on that the ark of Noah was seen as a new Eden and as a prefigurement of the church, where all of creation would be gathered into a new world order, so to speak. The church is necessary for salvation. Hence, they could not be saved, who, knowing that the Catholic Church was founded as necessary by God through Christ, would refuse either to enter it or to remain in it. Right? So, it's not, it's not enough for us to enter in. We need to remain. How many people end up thinking... Sadly, well, once I'm confirmed, I've graduated. I've received all of the sacraments that I need, and I don't need to participate in living the faith anymore. Well, that's not going to bring you to salvation. So no, that's not the case. We need to enter in, and we need to remain. And this affirmation is not aimed at those who, through no fault of their own, do not know Christ and His church, but seek God with a sincere heart. So there are some people still in this world to this day who have never heard of Christ, or they don't... Uh, truly understand who he is and what he's done. And if they end up dying, you know, never having received that, well, that's no fault of their own. And so therefore we don't condemn them because of that. Because how shall they believe, right? Because if they've never heard, how can they come to believe? They can know that there is a God, again, through our natural reason, through the, the natural law written upon our minds and upon our hearts, but they can't know what they've never heard. And so that's why we are called again to go to them to make God known, and as the Catechism reminds us, to evangelize all men. So whenever you hear bishops, uh, certain bishops may be saying, well, we don't need to evangelize, we don't need to convert. Well, uh, Your Excellency, it's right there in the Catechism. In our Catechism, we need to evangelize all men. And that, that's how we remain in obedience to the command of her founder, and to preach the gospel to all men, making disciples of all nations. Because there are many who are like sheep without a shepherd, right? And so, like I said, there is a significant decrease in priests in this world today. So that's why we need to pray for vocations. We need to do penance for vocations and encourage vocations. But when there is a shortage in a certain area, the next best thing is someone who, is well no who has a lot of knowledge about the faith, who has lived the faith for a very long time to help people understand. That's what it means to be a missionary disciple, which is, again, the goal of our parish. We should, be mo we should be like Jesus when his heart was moved with compassion for people, when he saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd. Because the church's mission, the ultimate purpose, is to make men share in the eternal love of the Most Holy Trinity. That is our ultimate goal. And how will people experience this? It is through the salvation of souls. That is our ultimate mission. The mission of the church is the salvation of souls, right? For parents who are the domestic church, right? We are meant to raise our children through word and through example, through how we love one another in our marriage, through how we relate to our family members, to how we relate to our brothers and sisters in our daily activities. We are meant to show them through word and through example how to live the gospel. Because under the leadership of the father, the priestly figure, the priestly head of the family, they are meant to reflect again through how 
We live who we are, the image of Christ, in order to gather people into the new and eternal covenant. Because it's from God's love for all men that the church receives the obligation of her missionary dynamism. He desires all men to be saved and to come to know the truth. That is something we need to remember. God wants all men to be saved. Jesus says to St. Faustina in the Divine Revelation Apparitions, See, I don't send people to hell. My mercy doesn't want to, but my justice demands it. People choose to go there by choosing not to live in, a, in union with me. And so therefore, because I am just, I will honor their free will. They wanted to live life separated from me, so therefore I will let them spend eternity separated from me. A very, very sad thing. So in the end, it's not God who condemns anyone, it's people who end up condemning themselves. So that's why the question, are you saved? Well, again, I don't know. I don't want to condemn myself. I hope I'm not. So that's why I'm striving to be as faithful as I can with everything that God gives to me through His church. Now, the Holy Spirit is the principal agent of the church's mission, who leads the church on her missionary path, which is, again, why it's important for us to have a relationship with Him. We should have a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, addressing them specifically. We address one of them. We address all of them, yes, but each of them is wanting to have a personal relationship with us. In the Colic Prayer, the first prayer of the Mass, who are we addressing? Which divine person are we addressing in the Colic Prayer? The first, let us pray. That's the Colic Prayer. We are addressing God the Father, because at the end of that prayer we always pray, through Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit forever and ever. So we are specifically addressing the Father. The, the Mass is specifically directed towards the Father, right? Showing how we are meant to have a relationship with Him through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that He bestows upon us and that we offer back to Him as we relive the sacrifice of Christ, the Paschal mystery of Christ in the Mass. Because on our pilgrimage, as the Eucharistic Consecration Book has been telling us, for all those who have been participating, and God bless you for having done so, thank you for working with us there, we are on a pilgrimage, right? We are not tourists in this life. We are, a, we are pilgrims. We are, we are on a mission, on a pilgrimage back to where? Yeah. To paradise that we had lost in Eden. We are on our way back to paradise. Paradise was closed off to us, but Jesus, the new Adam, reverses the sin of the first Adam, and therefore paradise is open to us again where we all have access to it, mainly through the church. So the church, therefore, has also experienced the discrepancy between the message she proclaims and the human weaknesses of those to whom the gospel has been entrusted. Now, what are those human weaknesses? Our vices and our sins, right? So, as, like we said, the church is an organization built up of sinners. Even the Pope himself is a sinner. He's human, right? He's meant to set the ultimate example. That's why he's uh, referred to as your holiness. So he is meant to reflect the image of Christ more than anyone, but he still sins. St. John Paul II would go to confession every single day because he was always finding more shortcomings about himself, right? You know, that's a wonderful thing to do because he lives in the Vatican surrounded by priests. But that's not something that we all have the, the ability to do. All the more reason to go to Mass as often as we can to have our venial sins taken away by Christ. Because only by taking the way of penance and renewal, the narrow way of the cross, can the people of God extend Christ's reign. The need for repentance for sins of the past and for, and for lukewarm witness. Because I said before, there are two things that God absolutely does not tolerate as the scriptures relate to us. That's hypocrisy and lukewarmness, right? Hypocrisy when we say one thing and do another, and lukewarmness where we're neither hot nor cold, right? And rather we are content with just staying where we are in our lives of faith. And so those are things that are not tolerated. So, see, a lot of people tend to think that Jesus was this hippie, pushover, nice guy. And so we see that Jesus is incredibly kind-hearted, but he, he's not, uh, he's not uh, necessarily nice, right? He's, you know, he, he's good, he's holy, he's just, but, you know, he told it like it is, right? You know, he called, he called sin out, he called evil out, he didn't let people remain in their ignorance, he didn't let people remain in error, and that is what we are called to do. We are called to do just that in imitating him by bringing the fullness of the truth of the church to, to other religions, to other faith backgrounds. The Catholic Church rejects nothing of what is true and holy in other religions. Their teachings often reflect a ray of truth. So in things like Buddhism, even Islam, believe it or not, in Hinduism, there are certain rays of the truth, 
right? There are certain rays. There's not the fullness of it, but there are certain rays, right? So everything about the truth in these other religions that they proclaim, we accept and we acknowledge, right? So that is how we build ecumenism. That's how we build communion and relationships with each other with the intention, the goal of bringing them to conversion, to repentance, right? And so as the, uh, the work Lumen, Gen Lumen Gentium in uh, paragraph 16 acknowledges, the church considers all goodness and truth found in them as a preparation for the gospel. So the potential and the preparation for receiving the fullness of the gospel is within their practices. It's within their lives already. It's within their hearts. We just need to help them come again to the fullness of it, right? But very often deceived by the evil one, who is Satan, the devil, men have become vain in their reasonings and have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. How often do we see that in our culture today, right? And served the creature rather than their creator, or else living and dying in this world without God, they are exposed to ultimate despair, meaning eternal damnation. To reunite all his children, scattered and led astray by sin, the Father willed to call the whole of humanity together into his Son's church. The world reconciled, right? Where we are all reconciled, despite our cultural differences, our geographical differences, whatever the case may be, we are all reconciled and brought into the fullness, again, of the truth. Now, the problem of relativism. Now, relativism is the false understanding of there being multiple truths or living according to one's own devices as long as it's convenient for them. People will say that the truth can adapt with the times, evolves with the times, while the church evolves with the times, just with the times, the truth itself does not. And because what that would be is moral relativism. And that is a heresy because the truth does not change with times. As I said, it's black and white. Why do you think priests are walking around in black and white all the time? It's because we represent the truth and the truth is black and white. Ha <laughs> ha. So, no, the truth does not evolve. It does not progress over time because if it were to do so, then there would be no unification of us. And therefore, the goal that we are all aiming for would be completely chaotic, right? There are say that people say that there are many roads that lead to one destination. While that may be true in this life, there is only one road that leads to eternal life, and it is a narrow gate, as the Gospels relates. Those who enter through it are few. And so that is why the church has received that message and that responsibility of proclaiming that understanding to all the world, saying that whatever is true about your ideology, we acknowledge and accept as your preparation for the gospel. However, there are certain things that cannot be accepted and cannot be embraced. So therefore, we want, you to, we want to introduce you to Jesus Christ for the sake of the salvation of all of humanity. That's why dialogue is so important, right? When we can't have civil conversations anymore, when we can't have uh, discussions with differing points of view peacefully, then that's when we fall into serious problems. Because in a, in a religious dialogue does not dispense from evangelization. So, again, yes, we want to enter into a peaceful and appropriate dialogue with folks, but not at the expense of evangelization not at the expense of conversion, because dialogue should be conducted with the conviction that the church is the ordinary means of salvation and that she alone possesses the fullness of the means of salvation, right? So the ordinary means, everything that has been given to us, right? Everything that has been revealed, all must be converted to Christ and all must be incorporated into him by baptism and into the church, which is his body. So the relationship between church, the church and Judaism today. Let's take a brief look. So let's see, is this statement true? Jews already dwell in a saving covenant with God, and therefore companions that target Jews for conversion to Christianity are no longer theologically acceptable in the church. No. See, it's true that God has revealed, them, revealed himself to them first, a lot of what we have has been passed down and inherited by them, but they are now, unfortunately, living outside, outside of the covenant. Now, there are what are called Messianic Jews who recognize Jesus as the Savior and the Messiah, yes, but they are also not living according to the sacramental practices of the church. And so, therefore, they are being deprived significantly of the mediation of grace. 
So salvation by the Torah, so the, so the Jewish law. So a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Uh, St. Paul to the Galatians, chapter 2. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. So St. Paul is talking about how the old law, while it was important to live according to the times of the old covenants, the old covenants are now fulfilled. And so therefore, are no certain laws, like the kosher laws of not eating pork, for example, are no longer necessary. Not that they never had any significance, but they are no longer necessary because they have been fulfilled, right? Jesus said that he, he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And that's exactly what he did. Israel, pursuing the law of old, of righteousness, has not attained the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. So, again, Jesus says to, about the Pharisees, you know, do whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example, because everything that they're telling you is right, but their hearts are far from the Lord. Again, they're doing everything right on paper, but they are not living, they are not doing what it is that they themselves are teaching. So that's why Jesus calls them hypocrites, right? Someone who says one thing and does another, right? They have not entered into the full atonement of sins. So we see again the blood atonement in the Exodus where the Israelites had to slay a lamb, a male lamb without blemish, again reflecting Jesus, who is, a, who is a, obviously a male without blemish, no sin, and sprinkle its blood on the doorpost to be protected from death. They had to perpetually offer blood sacrifices on the brazen altar of the tabernacle and the temple to atone for sins. On Yom Kippur, as we've heard, the high priest had to enter the Holy of Holies with the blood of a goat to atone for the sins of the people. Right? So the goat, you know, we hear from Jesus, you know, the, those who will go into paradise will be the sheep placed on his right. And then the goats will go into the fire of condemnation. They will be placed on his left. So the goat is symbolizing sin being put to death, right? Before the Ark of the Covenant in Yom Kippur. So there's one thing called the scapegoat. So the people of Israel would tie a scarlet sash around a goat's neck, and it would be literally sent out into the desert because the, dempo, the, the desert is said to be the place where the devil would reside, right? And, of course, Jesus does encounter the devil in the desert. And when that goat was sent out, the scarlet band would miraculously turn white, showing how the people's sins had indeed been cleansed and atoned for. And they, and they had done that every year for a very, very long time. And it always happened. The scarlet scarf signifying the, the blemishes and the sins of the people of Israel was made pure white, showing that their sins had been forgiven and atoned for. But that stopped happening when? at the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So they still sent the scapegoat out into the desert, but the scarlet would remain scarlet. It was not changing into white anymore because the people of Israel had not embraced Jesus as the Messiah. Many of them hadn't. A lot of them did, but there were still others who hadn't. So where is, the, the, where is now the atoning blood sacrifice of Jesus upon the, the cross? Jesus, the Lamb of God who is sacrificed upon the cross. That is why the temple was destroyed, right? At the sack of, when the Romans sacked Jerusalem, the temple was destroyed and never rebuilt because the animal sacrifices could only take place in the temple and the temple is no longer there. So that's why the Jews don't offer animal sacrifices anymore. They get together in their synagogues but to listen to the Torah, but there are no animal sacrifices anymore because the temple is not there because the Lamb of God has fulfilled those old ritual practices. Christ's mission was directed exclusively to the Jews. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Gentiles would eventually come later, specifically through the missionary of the Apostle Paul. But Jesus, of course, comes to gather in all nations. And the kerygma of the early church was also exclusively to the Jews. The first Christians were Jews first before they became Christians. Whoever denied the apostles, they were all Jews, right? But whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So Jesus affirms that there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The church and Judaism cannot then be seen as two parallel ways of salvation. 
and, for the, and the church must bear witness to Christ as the Redeemer for all. Now let's see. The church and other Christian denominations, right? The sole church of Christ subsists, as we have said, in the Catholic Church, and as the prophet Siri has proclaimed. <laughs> right? So, in the one church, from its very beginnings, there arose certain rifts, right? Later, large communities became separated from the Catholic Church. So, there were always rifts. There were always heresies, like, like uh, Arianism, Pelagianism, and all kinds of stuff like that that were taking place in the early church. There were uh, dividing sects. Within the, within the church, so sex, S-E-C-T-S. So just make sure that we're clear here. And so, um, so we, talk about in, we talked about in uh, the history lesson of the church about how in the beginning there were these, these uh, di people were dividing themselves thinking that they were in the right and the church was teaching uh, theological errors. But those errors were addressed through what? Through the ecumenical councils, the Council of Ephesus, the Council of Trent, the Second Vatican Council, so on and so forth. But in the 16th century is when people in rather large numbers and groups through the Protestant Reformation were starting to come about. So that's what it, the catechism means. Larger communities became separated from us. And one cannot charge with the sin of the separation those now born in these communities. The Catholic Church accepts them with respect and affection as brothers. Yes, we do. But at the same time, we do not want to deprive them of being evangelized and converted out of their cults into the one true church, right? Many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside of the visible confines of the Catholic Church, yes. Just as we said, you know, in other religions, the rays of truth that they accept, that they acknowledge, we also acknowledge and accept. So just like in other Christian denominations that have sadly been established, we don't diminish the fact that there are also rays of truth that they teach. And we acknowledge that, which is why we embrace them as brothers, but want them to experience the full power of the mediation of grace between the, of the sacraments. Because Christ's Spirit uses these communities as means of salvation, whose power derives from the fullness of grace and truth that Christ has entrusted to the Catholic Church. Now, one classic example of this is in the Gospel, where the apostles are complaining to Jesus that we saw, he, they say, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, but they did not walk with us. And Jesus said, you know, let them alone. You know, anybody who is with me is with me. Yes, so if, uh, these, if these folks are doing something correctly according uh, to the way of Christ, you know, we let them be with it. But everything that they fall into error with, we want them to understand why it is they are in error. Not to condemn them, not to, again, to say that we're better than them, but out of love to show them what they are depriving themselves of, right? Now, are all Christian denominations equally valid? This is a big question, right? And the answer is no. No, they are not. It is only through Christ's Catholic Church, which is the all-embracing means of salvation, that the separated brethren can benefit fully from the means of salvation. So that like through our intercessory prayers, when we pray for people, we are praying on behalf of all of those who have not yet been gathered into the fold, right? So they come to means of salvation in the name of Jesus, but through our spiritual and evangelical efforts, that missionary mandate where we have an obligation to pray, where we have an obligation to preach, to teach, to catechize, something that is, again, required of us, not suggested, because the ecclesial communities which have not preserved the valid episcopate and the genuine and integral substance of the Eucharistic mystery are not churches in the proper sense. And what that means is, so these ecclesial, so these church communities, which have not preserved the valid episcopate, episcopate, so episcopacy, bishops, right? They have separated themselves from the original, from, from the bishops, right? They have separated themselves from the original magisterium. And so these ministers, these Protestant ministers, these pastors, as they're called, they say, uh, some of them say that they're ordained, but my question is, ordained to do what? What? You know, you're doing the same thing that you could have done before you were ordained. You're simply preaching the word. You're not confecting the Eucharist. You're not hearing confessions. You're not anointing the sick. So, ordained to do what? Right? Preach the word? Well, anybody can do that. Right? So, 
I don't really understand what exactly were you ordained to do, right? There's no ontological change within you because you have separated yourself from the magisterium, from the succession of the apostles through the bishops that has been passed down to us. So that's why these churches don't have sacraments. No, people are baptized validly in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We acknowledge that as a valid baptism, but these communities in their totality are not valid because the majority of them, they don't have... They don't have any type of magisterium. They don't have any type of organization. And so therefore, they are not valid. The Christian faithful are not permitted to imagine that the Church of Christ is nothing more than a collection of divided yet in some way one of churches and ecclesial communities. So when we say the Church, we are referring only to the Catholic Church, right? Because all of these other church is or denominations outside of us are not valid ecclesial communities in the fullness of the all-embracing means of salvation. Does this make sense to everybody? Yes. Yeah. have got one question. Mm -hmm. uh, why does Paul say in Corinthians chapter 12 that there is one body but many gifts? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that not mean that there are others that can be recognized with gifts? So they don't have the sacraments that are gifts. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a good question. So when St. Paul is referring to the, there is one body of Christ, but many gifts, meaning the gifts that individually we are all blessed with, right? See, the gifts that you have are different from the gifts that I've been blessed with, right? So, we're not re so when St. Paul says that, he's not referring to those that are outside of the community of Christ, the Catholic Church. He was re referring to the specific gifts and qualities that have been bestowed upon us. He says some will have the gift of tongues, some will have the gift of prophecy, some will have the gift of uh, discernment of spirits, right? Some will, have, uh, the, will gift, have the gift of healing. Some will have the gift of preaching, right? These are all gifts that are found within the confines of the Catholic Church. So he's not referring to uh, communities outside of the church separated from us. He's referring to how the members of the one body have their different function because of their different gifts. Like he talks about how the nose cannot function as the ear. The nose has its own purpose and vice versa. So... Like, there's, like, not all of us are sacramental priests, but we are all still members of the same body. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yes, but he went to the Gentiles. He went to the Catholic Church. So weren't the Gentiles, even though they were brought into the church body? Yes. Body. Yes, they were. They, they, when they became Christians, when they were accepted into the body of Christ, yes. They became, uh, even though they were Gentiles from the Jews of the covenant of old, they came into the one body that is the church, and they, they bless the missionary efforts of the church with their gifts, their particular gifts, at times their qualities, their characteristics, and their talents. Once they were members of the body of Christ as Christians, as members of the church. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good question. So, question. Uh, let's uh, let's go through a few more slides first, and then I promise we'll have some time for questions when we're done. Okay. So the Christian faithful again are not to imagine. The Church of Christ as being a whole bunch of separate denominations. The Church is one. We, that's why we profess in our creed, one holy Catholic and apostolic Church. One holy Catholic and apostolic. Apostolic, meaning that again, we have the missionary mandate. As the apostles were sent out, we all have the obligation to go out. And now, in this, particularly in this time, to invite people back into communion with us through the Bishop of Rome, which is all part of God's plan to establish a full and visible communion with him and with one another. Now, the Eastern Orthodox churches, they do have a valid priesthood by apostolic succession and the Eucharist. The Eucharist intercommunion with them is possible and even encouraged in certain circumstances. So they separated themselves from, uh, from Rome, yes, but they still have valid apostolic succession, meaning that they have valid sacraments. So if you were to receive communion, by participating in a, a, a Orthodox Eucharistic celebration, you would be receiving Jesus. It is valid. Now, separate, no, those who are separated from the uh, valid apostolic succession are the Protestants. Their communities have not preserved the proper reality of the Eucharistic mystery in its fullness, especially because of the absence of the sacrament of holy orders, because without valid holy orders, meaning the priesthood, you cannot have valid sacraments, because there is no one there to confect them, to offer them. 
And for this reason, Eucharistic intercommunion with these communities is not possible. So if a Protestant minister were to come and participate in Mass with us, could he celebrate with us in the sanctuary? No, he couldn't. If there was an Eastern Orthodox priest who is a valid priest, could he come to the Roman ritual with us and celebrate in the sanctuary? Yes, he could. Yes, he could. All Catholics are called to take an active and intelligent part in the work of ecumenism. So ecumenism means the gathering in of all other faith-based backgrounds and denominations, establishing peaceful and healthy relationships with them for the sake of evangelization, for the sake of bringing them into the full communion of the new covenant. And we need to continue to work to, to move towards unity. The church must pray and work to perfect the unity that Christ has willed from her from the beginning. It is my prayer, Jesus says, that they all may be one as you, the Father, and I are one. May they be one in us. That's why we are called to avoid the false, where the purity of Christian doctrine suffers loss at the hand of that, and its genuine meaning is clouded, right? So things, things required, we are meant to move towards unity. That's why we pray in every Mass, Lord, grant us peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. We are striving for a permanent renewal of the Church, conversions of hearts, prayer in common with everyone fraternal knowledge of each other, therefore ecumenical formation with each other. That's what it means to move towards unity. We are all called into the vineyard. All are called to participate, therefore, in the church's mission. All Catholics are called to take an active and conscious and responsible part in the mission of the church, not just the priests, not just the religious brothers and sisters, but all of us. And you as the laity have a more vital role than ever before in church history. Because with the limited number of priests in the world, so many religious orders are dying off because there are no vocations, they're disappearing. A lot of religious orders are disappearing because they don't have vocations. So that's, so that's why we're called to respect and obey according to the truth, the clergy and the religious, because of the mission that they have been given, yes, but it's a mission that we are all called to share in together. You know, why, am I, why did I want to teach you these classes? I want to teach you because not only do I love you, and because I love the faith, I want you to know more so that you can have this information and be armed with it for the sake of evangelization, for the sake of ecumenism, because we need to train you. We need to help prepare you to be those missionary disciples that we are focusing on here in the diocese, but especially here at St. Bernard's. Because Jesus himself says right there, Matthew 12, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So therefore, we ask the Father to send out laborers for the harvest, not just priests, but all of us. And woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, says St. Paul. So should we fear man or should we fear God? Who will stand at the gap before God on behalf of the land, the prophet Ezekiel asks. If you give the wicked no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. So when people say that, you know, you're a Christian, you're not supposed to be all judgy, and this, that, and the other thing, think of Ezekiel 3.18. If we are not proclaiming the gospel, if we are not striving to correct, despite people having their feelings hurt, then the sin will be held against us, the sin of omission. Again, the classic example of John the Baptist, where he told Herod Antipas that marrying his brother who was still living, marrying his wife Herodias was not lawful. And woe to me if I don't tell you, for God will hold that sin against me. So when we proclaim that abortion is wrong in every circumstance, when we proclaim that homosexual actions are wrong according to the moral law, it is not because we hate it is not because we discriminate, it's because we love. It's because we love and we don't want the sin of omission to be upon our souls by remaining silent. For what did St. Paul just say? Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel and woe to me if I obey men rather than God. Amen? Amen. Okay, so how shall we do it then? Good question, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> First, we need to repent. If we have neglected to respond to the call 
to the work for the harvest, then again, that is on us. You know, before you take the splinter of your brother's eye, he sa says the Lord, remove the wooden beam within your own eye. So we constantly need to be turning inwardly on ourselves first, saying, acknowledging that we are sinners, and the, therefore we need to become the change that we wish to see in the world first. If we want the world to change, we need to become the change. And by becoming that change, we can inspire others to change as well through continuous repentance, because repentance is not just a one-time thing, just as conversion is not a one-time thing. It's continuous throughout the course of our lives, and we are meant to desire even to see our worst enemies enter the kingdom, i.e. the church. That's why we pray for the salvation of unbelievers. We pray for those who persecute us, where we strive to love and not hate our enemies, so that we participate fully in the church's sacramental life to be fully joined with Christ, the Lord of the harvest. So we're called to live our Christian lives fully, to be a witness in deeds. Because again, being Christian is not something that we do, it's being who we are. So we need to study and we need to learn how to share our faith more and more so that we don't become lukewarm, right? I'm still learning things about faith that I never, that I never knew before. I'm constantly learning. And so that's why we should give our time to study a little bit each day, if it, even if it's just 10 minutes. You know, read a little something about church history. Read a little something about the spiritual works of the church fathers or the spiritual leaders and the spiritual masters of the church, like Therese of Lisieux, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, all of them. Invite people, inform them of, the, of these classes, different things that are going on. Invite them to Mass. People will say no, and that's fine. But we need to invite them. We need to take the initiative because how are we going to grow, continue to grow in holiness as well as in number if people are not being invited and letting them know that we're here, letting them know that there's fellowship for them, that there's purpose for them here, right? Because man needs purpose. We talked about that in the very beginning. So we need to give them the information, pass on literature about the faith when appropriate. And so that is why we are called to a missionary mandate. Peoples everywhere open the doors to Christ. His gospel in no way detracts from man's freedom. So, no, we are not imprisoning people here, right? The faith does not imprison people. It sets people free from the respect that is owed to every culture and to whatever is good in each religion. By accepting Christ, you open yourself to the definitive word of God, to the one in whom God has made himself fully known and has shown us the path to himself in the Catholic Church. So that is our missionary mandate. That is how we are all called to participate in it. To live it, to share it, and to love it. So with, uh, just, uh, we'll take these last few minutes just to open up uh, any questions that we still have that weren't addressed. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. You, those are um, uh, encyclicals written by the Holy Fathers. You know, for like uh, LG is Lumen Gentium, and uh, there are other there are other ones there that were abbreviated. But uh, I'm the uh, Latin terminology is escaping me right now. But um, th those are all taken from uh, uh, ecumenical works through the the encyclicals written by the Holy Fathers by the popes. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yep. What you, are you asking? What do we say to people who complain about the wealth of the church? Yeah, well, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. yeah. well, the see the the wealth of the church is used for the service to the people, so that's what that's what we say. See the the church, everything that uh, the church has. You know, there are a lot of so there are a lot of areas where the church isn't very isn't wealthy at all. You know, there are parishes closing down all over the place on the east coast and all kinds of things like that. So we use our wealth not for not for the sake of enriching ourselves, but it's for the sake of enriching others. You know, we use the resources that we have to serve the poor, to build homes, to build uh, uh, to build assistant uh, assisted living facilities, all kinds of things like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, well, that's uh, well, that's exactly what we do. We do take care of the poor. But you know that the the Vatican has all those majestic things. It's not for the it's not for the exaltation of the men. It's for the glorification of God. See, even Francis of Assisi himself, the man of poverty, said, "Only the best for God." So we are we have all of that to reveal the glory and the majesty of God in service to Him. It's not to exalt ourselves. Because the beauty of Catholic iconography, of the sacred vessels that we use to offer the Mass, is to show God's kingship, to show His majesty. To sh and it's meant to be an image of beauty for the sake of drawing people into the reverence of the Mass. Because why do we see, we talked about before, the beauty of so many Catholic, uh, traditional Catholic churches. It's not to exalt uh, one's wealth. It's to show the faith of the people who have contributed so much of their own blessings to the building of this place for the sake of people having an, an enriching spiritual experience when they come here, right? It's not to boast of wealth. It's to allow people to enter into the divine nature of the Mass, to experience heaven on earth, which is exactly what it is, to inspire them to pray because God is the creator and the image of everything that's good, true, and beautiful. So in a physical, sensual way, we want to reflect that not for the sake of exalting, uh, not of exalting our wealth or enriching us because, you know, as a, you know, a lot of people think that priests are rich. I'm not rich. <laughs> I'm not rich. My, my salary is very, very humble and, uh, and I like it that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. A little louder if you please. You got You got to yell at me, get mad at me. Yeah. Yeah. Ye ye yell at me. Uh-huh. Right, that's, uh, so she was asking, don't we use our wealth as well for the sake of preserving the treasures that we have from throughout church history all the way back from, uh, to Christ himself? And the answer is yes, absolutely. And we have uh, the, uh, the Vatican Library, the Vatican Archives, things that have uh, such amazing treasures that have been just preserved throughout the centuries, throughout the course of our history. And yes, we use... Uh, the, the wealth that is uh, bestowed upon us by God so beautifully to protect and preserve that, absolutely. You know, when, uh, when Notre Dame was set on fire in Paris, you know, the priest uh, who was there, God bless him, ran in and saved the, the true crown. He got Jesus in the Eucharist out of the Notre Dame. He got the relic of the, of the crown that Jesus, the, the original crown of thorns that had been preserved for this time, he got him out. And so... Yes, we have the resources that we have available to us for the sake of preserving our history, for preserving our tradition and all of the treasures that we have. Mm -hmm. Then uh, also God, when he spoke to Moses and gave him specific orders on how to build the ark, the ark was also with jewels and, and, and gold, and, you know, certain wood mm -hmm. and gold. Yep. And that was also for his glory. Yep, it was all for his glory. See... See, Jesus, uh, see, God said to, to David, you know, you see how I've been dwelling in a tent. You know, I never once asked you to build a temple for me, but your son will do that for the sake, uh, for the sake of uh, glorifying me. Yes, which is wonderful because the temple would eventually become, become one of the seven wonders of the world at the time. People from all over come to see it because there was something about the place that drew them there spiritually. And that's what our, our churches are meant to do. It's meant to draw people in through the overwhelming of their senses. You know, why do we cover everything in the church right now? It's because it's meant to be an overwhelming of our senses to bring us to a place of mourning. We are entering a place of mourning because Jesus is about to go to the cross for us. So we use things like that to to have uh, spiritual experiences, but also to connect that through our senses. So yes, God told the people to build the ark a certain way, build the temple the tabernacle a certain way because there was all sim there was a whole bunch of symbolic significance to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I was going to make a comment more than a question. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, so um, you know, the church has provided um, hospitals, schools, missionaries all over the world for the history of the church. You know, helping people and mm -hmm. taking care of people and the church has done more than any other organization in that regard. Mm -hmm. And I and I think that we all have to remember, but when we walk into St. Peter's, to me, I don't think, oh, they should be using all this for the for you know the poor people, because we, we already do that. Mm -hmm. I look at that as this gift from God and the, the people that built that 
they did it for God, mm-hmm. right? They, they, when they, even the people that laid the stones were mm-hmm. doing that for God. Yep. They did what they thought heaven looked like. Mm-hmm. And when people couldn't read and there wasn't a Bible, there were stained glass windows so everybody could learn the ca- their catechism and learn. You know, I just, mm-hmm. I feel like um, I get a little defensive when I hear people say stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I completely understand. You know, what she was saying is, is that, uh, see, when there are basilicas in, in, uh, in Europe, for example, that took centuries and centuries to build, you know, sometimes people would start all over again because they believed that because of their faith, it was falling short of the glory of God. So people who started these projects, they didn't even leave, live to see uh, the completion of it because they weren't doing it for the sake of boasting of church wealth. They were doing it because of their faith in God and, and a service to Him. And when people were... Uh, illiterate, like she was saying, and uh, the scriptures were only reserved for the masses because, again, people couldn't read. The story of salvation was told through things like Catholic iconography, through stained glass windows, through our art. That was a way of communicating salvation, and it was a way of evangelizing the people in a way that they could understand. And so, so yes, you know, a lot of people, we, it's very natural to want to get defenses saying about, no, no, you're wrong. No, this, this is the truth. But that's, again, why we are called to the best of our ability with the help of God's grace. We want to be patient with those who, who may not understand, you know, as, as easy it is. We all experience the temptation. I know I do. I want to defend my bride. You know, I'm married to, I'm married to the church, and anyone who insults my bride or my faith is insulting me. And, man, that's something that I don't go for. But, uh, <laughs> but at the same, you know, you know, you're insulting my bride. You're insulting me, man. And so, but... Uh, that, but that's why we're just called to continue to ask the Holy Spirit to help us to approach it with a place of patience and understanding because, you know, as I'm always saying, and I, I, know, I always say it because I constantly need to remind myself too, you know, we need to meet people where they're at in their lives of faith rather than where we wish they were. Because that's the whole point of the missionary mandate. With those whose faith is weak, for those of us whose faith is strong, we need to be patient with them and say, well, no, I'm, so, I'm, sorry, you've, I'm sorry you've been misinformed, but let me tell you what uh, the, the actual purpose of that is and help them come to a place of understanding. And I need to work on that. Lord knows I need to work on that. But just, So please pray for me in that regard. So right back here. Well, it account, it account, he's asking the question, how does the church account for Judas being one of the twelve? Well, it shows like how we were talking about how there have been popes in the past who have been uh, uh, very sinful people and bishops and priests in the past who have been very sinful people. It's a testimony to how, of course, the church is built up of sinners, sadly, even amongst the clergy. Jesus was betrayed by one of his own. And so there's always going to be those bad apples, unfortunately, but it... Uh, the, the position of the twelve after G- Judas took his own life, the, the twelfth position was filled by Matthias. In the Acts of the Apostles, we talk about how the place of Judas, that was filled by Matthias when, he, when the lots of favor fell upon him and therefore he was chosen to take the place of Judas. So that's uh, when we refer to the twelfth when, Jud- when the place of Judas was taken by Matthias. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, the question was, will there, will I have more classes for you? And the answer is yes. But, but the uh, the question of when is up in the air right now. We'll pro- I'll probably do uh, one once a month from now on. Now that Lent is over and we're entering into Easter, we're, we'll do one probably in April and in May, and then we'll take some time because a lot of the a lot of the folks who are snowbirds will be going will be going home for the summer months, and so we'll probably put it on hold until September or October. It just depends on what Father Fred said and. Uh, how we can work with the parish schedule, but yes, there there will be more. <laughs> so, one sec, one sec. So, why we had uh, we had one more question back there? Yes. Well, that, that was the thing we were talking about. The, the confusion that arises is, is that, see, when a Protestant minister, someone who is outside of the, uh, the apostolic succession, when they say that they're ordained, the question that arises in my mind, again, is ordained to do what? You know, you don't... You, oh, someone is married by a Protestant pastor? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, the, the, that uh, is an invalid ordination. So all, 
all of the uh, Protestant pastors outside of apostolic succession are invalid ministers, we would say. And anyone who enters into a marriage uh, uh, with them, uh, it's not um, a valid marriage in the eyes of the church. So that's why anybody who is wanting, who is converting but is already married, you know, civilly according to the law, they would need uh, to have their mass, uh, excuse me, their marriage um, blessed or uh, validated by the church by marrying sacramentally within, uh, within, within her walls and being, uh, having it witnessed by an actually valid ordained priest, minister. Does that make sense? Very good. Thank you. Well, thank you all. We're about out of time. So, 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 so we'll close with a prayer. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And thank you again so much for your participation. Thank you very much.